Yep. It's that time. I knew this day was coming. At some point, my journey through every Razzie Worst Picture winner would bring me here. And here we are. Based on the Andrew Lloyd Webber stage musical of the same name, Cats hit theaters just in time for the holidays in the year of our Lord 2019. Oh, what a wonderful Christmas present this was. And for some people, it was probably the last movie they saw in theaters before lockdown. For me, it was Bloodshot, which still wasn't great, but at least it wasn't Cats. I don't know if it's the worst movie I've reviewed on this show, but it may very well be the most fascinating. In terms of how in the holy hell is this even a thing, it's right up there with the likes of Can't Stop the Music, The Oogie Loves, and Showgirls. And I can't believe I just referred to those movies in the same sentence, but here we are. We can go ahead and get this out of the way right now. This was the worst movie of 2019. The Razzies got that one right. And it did have some stiff competition. The other Worst Picture nominations included Rambo Last Blood, which was utterly forgettable and a pitiful send-off for this character, Amadea Family Funeral, where every scene went on about five times as long as it needed to, but for Medea, that's par for the course. The Haunting of Sharon Tate, which was as tasteless as it was bizarre, and The Fanatic, a pile of pure cringe starring John Travolta in one of the biggest missteps of his career and directed by Fred Durst. Yes, that Fred Durst. The Fanatic's nomination puzzled many people as it was initially in the running for the Barry L. Bumstead Award, which at the time was given to movies that had limited distribution and thus didn't qualify for the regular awards. But this category was quietly dropped, permanently it seems, and apparently limited distribution is no longer a disqualifier. Not sure what made them decide that now, but whatever. Personally, I am still baffled that Wonder Park did not receive a single nomination especially after all the behind-the-scenes drama that led to that movie having no credited director. I mean, the jokes write themselves. How did they miss that one? Anyway, Universal Pictures had high hopes for Cats, which seems hilarious in hindsight, but initially that wasn't the case. It was based on one of the most popular musicals in history, it had some huge names in the cast including Judi Dench, Idris Elba, and Jennifer Hudson, it had an Oscar-winning director in Tom Hooper, it had all the makings of a blockbuster. But then the first trailer hit. And the entirety of the internet collectively said... Wait, are they serious? And yes, somehow they were. They kicked the marketing campaign into full gear. They even had the movie on their For Your Consideration website. That's right, at one time they thought this shit would have Oscar buzz. They quietly removed it from the site after its theatrical release was an utter disaster. It took home about $75 million against a $100 million production budget while getting thoroughly trounced by critics and the poor moviegoers who actually bothered to see it. Cats coughed up one hell of a hairball. So where exactly did it all go wrong? Well, I suppose we should start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. The stage musical on which the movie is based is almost as old as I am, premiering in May of 1981 in the West End. Andrew Lloyd Webber based it on Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, a collection of poems by T.S. Eliot. The play tells the story of the Jellicle Cats as they come together for the annual Jellicle Ball, where one of the cats will be named the Jellicle Choice. They will then ascend to the heaviside layer and be reborn into a new life. Now some of you may be wondering, what the hell is a Jellicle? Well, here's the great Andrew Lloyd Webber to explain. All cats are jellicles, you see. This is made clear in one of the unpublished poems. Yes, but all are, the other cats dogs, are jellicle yeah, as well. Well, all cats are jellicle cats, fundamentally. You see, dogs are pollicle dogs, and cats are jellicle cats. Ah, so all dogs are pollicle dogs, and all cats are jellicle cats. Hmm. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Lloyd Webber. A follow-up question, if I may. Um, what? The Sung Through musical has very little plot or narrative structure to speak of, which was a deliberate choice, believe it or not. It's less a play and more a musical review. About 95% exposition with a little sprinkling of a story as one by one various cats introduce themselves in song. Apart from a few minor changes, the lyrics are taken directly from Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats and some unpublished poems Lloyd Webber obtained from Elliot's Widow. Most of the cats have very silly names, including, but not limited to, Jenny Annie Dots, Skimble Shanks, Mungo Jerry, Rumple Teaser, Athena, Cassandra, Demeter, The Rum Tum Tugger. Several of you have told me that is not meant to be a double entendre, and I want you all to know I do not believe you. Pounceable, Growl Tiger, Grizabella, Bustopher Jones, Asparagus, 
horseradish, etc., carbuckety, piddle paws, and Mr. Mistopheles. If you are not familiar with the musical, you may be surprised to learn I made three of those names up. For the record, they are Demeter, Asparagus, and Carbuckety. Except that's not true, those are all real. The three I actually made up are Athena, Horseradish, and etc. Except I'm still full of shit, etc. is real. Piddlepaws was the third name I made up. You know, as I reflect on these very, very strange cat names, the more I begin to realize that it really should not have come as a surprise when I learned that at one point in his life, T.S. Eliot had a drinking problem. So let's make something clear right up front. I don't get cats. All I see is a bunch of weird-ass people in weird-ass costumes singing weird-ass songs. I can appreciate the level of talent and effort involved in bringing this thing to life, and a couple of the songs are kinda catchy. I get why Memory was so popular, but overall it is decidedly not for me. But I may very well be in the minority, as Cats has grossed billions of dollars worldwide since its inception. Yes, I said billions, plural. This thing is a certified blockbuster. It did get mixed reviews when it opened on Broadway, but that certainly didn't stop people from flocking to see it. And if they got something out of it, great, more power to them. I don't get it. But I do get why Hollywood would want to turn this into a major motion picture. Indeed, they've been trying to do so since the 1990s. At one point, Steven Spielberg's Emblemation was supposed to do an animated version, but the studio closed before that could happen. Eventually, a live-action version of the movie went into production in the mid-2010s. And the end result was nothing short of amazing, though perhaps not in the way they intended. Well, no, not perhaps. Definitely not in the way they intended. The movie opens with a cat named Victoria, played by Francesca Hayward, getting stuffed in a pillowcase and tossed into the garbage. Well, that... is surprisingly dark. Several stray cats take notice of Victoria, and oh dear sweet lord, I feel like I just got stuffed into a pillowcase and tossed into the uncanny valley. Let's just start with the obvious, shall we? The visual effects. Why? Who thought this was a good idea? Obviously, this is a departure from the stage version, which featured actors in elaborate costumes. This time around, we have actors in computer-generated costumes, and boy, howdy, it does not look right. It feels like they're going for a photorealistic look, but they still don't look like actual cats. They're still humanoid in shape, they have human hands and feet and faces. These are not cats. This is a cat-like alien race whose ship crashed on Earth and they've been hiding out in London ever since. I'm a little surprised the movie doesn't end with the Jellicle choice getting taken by spaceship back to the cat's home planet. It would have made sense. I feel like there were two valid approaches here. Either keep the costumes from the stage version, or do a fully animated version like what Spielberg originally wanted. But what they did was neither here nor there, and it does not work. And it's not just the cats. There's a sequence taken straight from the stage version where Jenny Annie Dots interacts with some mice and cockroaches. This is what the cockroaches look like on stage. This is what they look like in the movie. Whose idea was this, and why are they not in prison? And why is Jenny Annie Dots casually eating several of these cockroaches she's apparently taught to sing and dance? I didn't think it was possible for this to get more disturbing, but they pulled it off. I'm honestly a little impressed by that. Anyway, all of this is made worse by the fact that the effects are clearly not done, and we'll get to why that is in a minute. The faces often don't appear to be attached to the bodies, and the cats sometimes appear to be floating over whatever they're supposed to be standing or sitting on. The unfinished effects were noted by several critics, including Alex Kranz for Gizmodo. I witnessed an entire man, knit cap and coat, just standing in a scene among a gathering of cats. I saw a terrifying gray statue looming over a character, only for it to blink and realize it's a woman who is a cat, but they colored her and then forgot to add fur. I cannot believe the movie was released in this state. But what's even more unbelievable is what happened next. Universal rather famously released a new version of the film a few days after its release with several CGI mistakes corrected. On the one hand, it is kind of impressive that technology has advanced to the point that studios can essentially patch a film after it has been released to theaters. On the other hand, I really wonder why they bothered. The poor visual effects certainly didn't help the movie's reception, but they were not the only problem. And by this point, the movie had already been savaged by critics and, well, 
anyone who saw the trailer, there was no saving this. The damage had been done. They'd have been better off saving Cats version 1.1 for the home video release. And this has me wondering if certain things in the movie are mistakes or not. For example, most of the cats do not wear shoes, but a handful do. Skimbleshanks the railway cat has a tap dancing number, so it's probably safe to assume his shoes are supposed to be there. But what about these cats wearing sneakers? Are they supposed to be there, or did they just forget to paint over them? We may never know. Also, did they fix the problem near the end of the movie where Judy Dench's human hand with her wedding ring was clearly visible? Nope, that's still there. Wow. Even on the DVD, they didn't fix that. Remarkable. Now, if you're wondering why the visual effects are as bad as they are, reportedly there is an explanation for this. And his name is Tom Hooper. I think most people had a generally positive opinion of Hooper prior to Cats. He won a Best Director Oscar for The King's Speech and had experience directing a musical film with Les Miserables, which was generally well thought of by critics, Russell Crowe's performance notwithstanding. I personally think Crowe isn't the only problem with that movie, but it was still good overall. The thing is, Hooper's prior films were not particularly CGI heavy, and based on comments from the VFX artists who worked on Cats, he was out of his depth. He apparently did not understand the concept of a play blast, reviewing the filmed footage to confirm the placement and motion of the actors is correct before they draw the effects. Oh no, he insisted any footage he reviewed had to be fully rendered. This resulted in the artists having to work much longer hours than they would have with a competent director. Reportedly, it took them six months just to put together that first trailer. And then they had four months to do the rest of the movie. I have done the math on that one, and my calculations tell me Hooper needs to be kicked in the dick. Hey, you can't argue with math. On top of reportedly working 90 hours a week for several months, one artist described Hooper as a slave-driving bastard, constantly abusive and demeaning and making bizarre requests, like asking to see actual cats perform the same actions as the actors. This guy apparently expected to see actual cats dancing. That boy ain't right. One of the more hilarious stories about the making of the film involves an earlier cut where the cats, for some reason, had rendered buttholes. This caught a lot of people by surprise when they were reviewing the footage one day, as no one actually asked for this. It just kind of happened. I cannot prove this, but I suspect a tired and angry VFX artist did this just to see how long it would take people to notice. And eventually they did, and another VFX artist, or maybe the same one, who knows, had to go through and edit out all of the buttholes. I'm sure this greatly disappointed the cast of Hello from the Magic Tavern. If you know, you know. If I'm being honest, a part of me kind of wants to see the butthole cut just to verify that it exists, but I don't want the butthole cut to happen if it means any VFX artist has to spend one more minute working on this film, because it sounds to me like they have been through enough. Anyway, the fine people behind this movie, and Tom Hooper, decided to make a few changes from the original stage production. This time around, there's a much bigger focus on Victoria, who was a minor character in the original version. Basically, she's here to serve as the audience's POV and show off her rather impressive ballet skills. Where she goes, so goes the plot. Oh yeah, they also attempted to give the movie a plot. A futile attempt in my opinion, but bless them they tried. This involved adding some actual spoken dialogue, unlike the stage version which was entirely sung through. Unfortunately, a lot of that dialogue was... bad. Cat got your tongue? Oh god, that line would be bad enough on its own, but it's reminding me of Catwoman which just makes it worse. Cat got your tongue? We also get a lot of attempted humor from Jenny Anydots and Bustopher Jones, played respectively by Rebel Wilson and James Corden. And it's about what you would expect from Rebel Wilson and James Corden. Yes, pratfalls, getting hit in the head, scratching yourself, that's what you're here for. For better or worse, the people who made this movie know them well. Look at you and look at me and you know, you know that I'm sensitive about my size. And yet you embarrass me, you... <laughs> that's what I say to you. <laughs> Until actual humor can be found, please enjoy this substitute. Similar to the stage version, the cats have gathered to see which cat Old Deuteronomy, played by Judy Dench, will choose to get a chance at reincarnation. McCavity, played by Idris Elba, would very much like to be the Jellical choice and kidnaps the rest of the contenders to ensure his victory. McCavity had a much smaller part in the original version, but this time around he's the story's main villain. And apparently he's also a wizard with teleportation powers. Very silly teleportation powers. Cavity. 
I'm sorry, what in the hell was that? And let's talk about McCavity's appearance, shall we? This is what he looked like on stage. That's the stuff of nightmares. In the movie, he's still the stuff of nightmares, but for completely different reasons. Unlike most of the other cats, his fur is basically all one solid color and very close to Idris Elba's actual skin tone. And when he's not wearing his hat and coat, oh boy. I'm almost wondering if I need to blur this out because he somehow looks more naked than he would if he actually were naked. I'm not even sure if that makes sense, but you see it, right? I mean, you wish you didn't see it. Well, maybe you don't. I don't know what you're into. I'm not here to judge, out loud. Anyway, after magically snatching the other cats, McCavity shows up with Taylor Swift cats, and I imagine the two of them are making all the furries stand at attention, and he declares himself the winner by default. But old Deuteronomy is like, nah, kitten, please, you know it don't work like that. And he's like, uh-huh, and she's like, nuh-uh, and he's like, McCavity! And they gone. But the other cats encourage Mr. Mistopheles, the magical cat, to magic Deuteronomy back. And it takes him a few tries, but eventually, it works. Oh well, I never. And then Grizabella, played by Jennifer Hudson, shows up and sings her ass off and Deuteronomy is like, you sing good, you win. And she climbs into a hot air balloon and ascends into heaven and she sitteth at the right hand of the father. I don't know, I have no idea what's going on. None of this makes sense. I don't know why they tried to make it make sense. That was a mistake. And I suppose the only other thing to talk about is the music. And... It is what it is. The singing was fine overall, although Judy Dench and Ian McKellen's best days are clearly behind them, and it was a little weird hearing Taylor Swift and Jason Derulo using fake English accents. The movie features one new song, Beautiful Ghosts, written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Taylor Swift, and sung by Francesca Hayward in the movie, and Swift in the credits. And it's perfectly fine. Honestly, if they hadn't pulled the Oscar consideration, it might have had a legitimate shot in a nomination. The rest of the music comes directly from the stage version, and it is also perfectly fine, although some of the songs are repetitive as hell. I've already told you Cats is very much not for me, and putting the same songs on the big screen doesn't change that. But Jennifer Hudson killed when she sang Memory. The snot coming out of her cat nose was unnecessary, but still, she's good. And Skimbleshanks the Railway Cat wasn't half bad either, but I didn't find anything else particularly noteworthy. No pun intended. Well, what else can I say? Cats was a catastrophe. And I feel bad for everyone involved, apart from Tom Hooper, who, as previously stated, needs to be kicked in the dick. Nor do I feel bad for Rebel Wilson or James Corden, who are right where they belong but everyone else has my sympathy. I especially feel bad for Judy Dench. If you didn't know, she was supposed to be the original Grizabella way back in 1981, but tore her Achilles tendon in rehearsal about a week before they opened and never got to be a part of the show. I imagine getting cast in the movie was a dream come true, tying up a loose end in her legendary career. And this was the end result. She deserved better. They all deserved better. This was an absolute mess, and the fact that it even exists at all just boggles my mind. This is hands down one of the worst movies I have ever seen. And you know what I'm about to say, don't you? Everybody should see it. Cats is one of the most spectacular train wrecks I have ever seen, and I wholeheartedly recommend this movie without hesitation. You may never get to see the version that was originally released to theaters, nor will you get to see the butthole cut, but the version you can see on DVD and not HBO Max is priceless. And it has to be seen to be believed. Although I've seen it several times and I'm still not sure I believe it. And yes, there is a riff tracks. You think Mike, Kevin, and Bill were gonna pass this one up? And spray! <laughs> <laughs> so sit back, make some popcorn, and enjoy, no, that's not the right word, experience the insanity that is cats. Just be aware that what has been seen cannot be unseen. And there's nothing at all to be done about that. Next time... Oh, God. I gotta talk about that damn pillow peddler, don't I? Well, until then, I am the Smeghead. And Hollywood needs to start treating its VFX artists better. And their writers. And everyone, really.
I believe you truly are a jellical cat. A jellical cat. Fuck off. That's what it means?